Thank you for joining us today as we have our worship service together again online. Good to have you. I was recently thinking back to when our family first arrived in Bangkok and there was certainly a lot that we had to adjust to that was very different from anything that we had ever known. You know, I grew up on a farm outside of a small town in southeastern Virginia and moving to a city of what was then 13 million people, <laughs> there were a lot of adjustments, a lot of changes of things that I had to get used to. One of those was the traffic. And I remember one day early on when, when uh, we were driving somewhere and I came up to a major four-way intersection and I needed to go left. Well, it looked like everything was clear, everything was good. There was a turn lane there, so I took it and followed that. As soon as I got around the turn, there was a policeman waiting on the side and he waved me over and started writing me a ticket. Um, I didn't realize it at the time, but I had gotten into a bus lane. Now, I would have liked to have used the excuse that, well, you know, I'm just a foreigner. I don't know how things work here. I don't know the traffic patterns. But I realized before I even said anything that that was not a good excuse. You know, if I was going to live in this big city and drive on the streets here, I needed to learn the rules of the traffic just like anyone else. And so using the excuse that I didn't know really was not a good excuse. Fortunately, the, the policeman ended up letting me go and I didn't get the ticket that day. But I did learn some good lessons about being more careful when I was driving. But you know, I think it's our human nature to make excuses. We like to find a way of passing off the responsibility or the accountability, especially if we've done something wrong or we've done something ridiculous. And we'd like to find a way of maybe blaming it on somebody else or, or something else. We like to make excuses. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. We're going to be in John chapter 15, verses 22 through 25. And we're going to see that on that particular night, Jesus was talking to his disciples. And he was talking about the response that he had gotten from the Jewish people, by and large. You know, there were some, like his disciples, that put their trust in him and followed him. But most of the nation did not believe Jesus was Messiah. Most of them refused him. And so the crowds were the ones that ended up calling for his crucifixion uh, the next day after he was teaching his disciples this particular thing that we'll look at today. But what Jesus was telling his disciples that evening was, God had provided everything the Jewish people needed. They should have known he was the Messiah. There was no excuse for them not to believe in God. So we'll take a look this morning at the idea that they were blind then. By and large, the Jewish people didn't recognize Jesus for who he was, so they did not accept him. And we will see that even today, a lot of people are still blind to the identity of who Jesus was. So we'll take a look at that and see how it is that we can apply that to our own lives uh, today. But before we do anything else, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, thank you so much for being with us today and giving us this opportunity to come and to be together in spirit, to be able to study some things from the scripture. I ask that you will take this message and make it yours. Please speak to us all. Give us the message, the understanding that we need today, each one of us. Help us to hear your truth and to know how we need to respond to you. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's take a look at John chapter 15, verses 22 through 25. And if you have your Bible, let me encourage you to, to have it ready as we will be looking at this passage and a number of others throughout the morning. So John 15, verses 22 through 25. Here's what Jesus said that evening to his disciples. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not be guilty of sin. Now they have no excuse for their sin. The one who hates me also hates my father. If I had not done the works among them that no one else has done, they would not be guilty of sin. Now they have seen and hated both me and my father. But this happened so that the statement written in their law might be fulfilled they hated me for no reason. So let's think first of all about the blindness that the Jewish people were living in. And again, I say it was, I talk about the Jewish people, it was most of them, not all of them, because some did respond. But the majority did not respond to Jesus, did not accept him for who he was. 
as a nation, they considered them to be themselves to be God's special people, and they were. If you go back to the time of Abraham, God called Abraham and said, I want you to leave your own country, leave your own people, and you'll go to a land that I will show you, and I will make you into a great nation, and I will use that nation to bless all the peoples of the world. And so the Jewish people were very proud of that and should be that God chose them out of all the peoples of the world. But somewhere along the way, they were drifting away from that. They were not being obedient to God. They were not walking with God. They were following empty religion, but they were not following God. And so at the time of Jesus, the Jews were in real danger in that they ended up hating Jesus, the one that did come as the Messiah. And Jesus said here that to hate him was to hate God. In verse 23, that's what he said word for word. The one who hates me also hates my father. And that's an interesting thing that the Jewish people called God their father, and yet they weren't following him any longer. And through that, because they weren't following God, they didn't recognize who Jesus was. But there were good reasons to believe Jesus was the Messiah. They just were missing it. So let's think about that for a minute. What were the reasons that the Jewish people had that they should have recognized Jesus as the Messiah? First of all, they had the scriptures. The scriptures pointed toward him as the Messiah. Go back in John to John chapter 5, verse 46. And on this particular day, when Jesus was talking to some of the Jewish people, listen to what he told them. He said, for if you believed Moses, you would believe me because he wrote about me. Now, when Jesus said, if you believed Moses, he was talking about the first five books of the Bible that Moses wrote, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And so Jesus was telling his disciples, and here telling the uh, other Jewish people that, even as far back as the absolute beginning of human history, when Moses was beginning to write that, already it was including information about the Messiah. And Jesus said, I'm here. It has told about me, and it was clear that it was pointing toward me. I am fulfilling it. So he just wanted to remind them that they had the scriptures that foretold the Messiah. And the Jewish people, interestingly, were looking for a Messiah. They just didn't think he would come in the form of Jesus. Jesus didn't fit their expectations. But because they were not following God any longer, they didn't recognize Jesus when he came. So Jesus said, you got the scripture. The scripture leaves you with no excuse. You should have known I was the Messiah. But also, he said, his miracles clearly proved he was the Messiah. Go back to uh, John chapter 15 and look at verse 24 again. And keep in mind this whole idea of Jesus and his miracles as proof that he was the Messiah. He said, if I had not done the works among them that no one else has done, they would not be guilty of sin. Now they have seen and hated both me and my father. You should think about what Jesus did when he was here. He healed people that were blind. He gave them their sight back. He healed people that were deaf, gave them their hearing back. He took a little bit of food, the two, the, uh, two fish, the five loaves of bread, and fed probably 10 to 15,000 people or more on that one occasion. He did it again with at least 4,000 men and their, their wives and children beyond that. So he multiplied food. He cast demons out of people. He raised people from the dead. He did lots of miracles. And the Jewish people, the leaders that really came to hate Jesus and wanted him dead, they couldn't deny that he had done these miracles. They stopped trying to do that. They couldn't because he'd done so much. But Jesus was saying, if you would stop and think, these very miracles that I'm doing are proof that I am who I say I am. So Jesus did the miracles, and he said, that's good proof. You, don't, you have no excuse for not believing because you could just watch what I do. But even that goes back to Scripture because the refusal of Jesus, of the Messiah, had been foretold in the Scripture. 
And John gives us some insight into that. In John chapter 12, verses 37 through 40, John tells us a connection with Isaiah's prophecies. Look at this. Even though he had performed so many signs in their presence, they did not believe in him. This was to fulfill the word of Isaiah the prophet who said, Lord, who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? This is why they were unable to believe because Isaiah also said, he has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts so that they would not see with their eyes or understand with their hearts and turn and I would heal them. So Isaiah is saying that same message that Jesus was getting at. That he said, you know, I've come. The scripture said I've come. Uh, the, the miracles that I'm, I've been doing prove that I'm the Messiah. But the Jewish people hate me, and through me they're hating God the Father. And actually we probably can turn that around some to say they had drifted away from God and lost sight of God. So out of that, they did not see Jesus, did not recognize who he was, to the point their eyes became spiritually blind and their hearts were hardened to the point that they had no idea Jesus was the Messiah any longer. No matter what he did, they did not accept it. And so God let them go that way. God did not force them to believe. God allowed them into that and gave them over to that hardened heart and blindness that was guiding them away from the spiritual truth, the, the reality, Jesus was the Messiah. So they had the scripture, they had the miracles, all of that put together should have, should have let them know Jesus really was who he said he was. So despite all they read and all they saw, the Jews chose not to believe. And that's the point I'm trying to get to. It was a choice. It was an act of their will. It wasn't something that just happened because they didn't have enough information. There was no excuse. That was what Jesus was saying. God had given them ample information to understand who he was. And let's go back to that whole idea of the Jews saying, well, God is our father. Well, Jesus had a really interesting, fascinating discussion with some of the Jewish people one day over that very issue. Because instead of serving God, the one they called their father, so instead of serving God, they were serving Satan instead. That's what John tells us in John chapter 8, verses 42 through 44. Listen to this. Jesus said to them, If God were your father, you would love me, because I came from God and I am here. For I didn't come on my own, but he sent me. Why don't you understand what I say? because you cannot listen to my word. You are of your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he tells a lie, he speaks from his own nature because he is a liar and the father of lies. So Jesus pointed out to them Without their even realizing it, their descent, running away from God, led them to the point they weren't serving God at all any longer. They were actually serving Satan. And that's a sad thing to say for the very people that God had chosen and wanted to use to share his love with the entire world. But again, there was no excuse. God provided all the Jews needed in order to believe. They had everything they needed. They just, somewhere along the way, chose not to believe. So they were blind then. Well, what about now? There are still people that are blind to this day to the truth of God, despite however much they might be presented with about him. But as in the past, there are still good reasons to believe in Jesus today for every single person. There is no exception. There is no excuse. That's what we want to recognize today. First of all, let's go to the Bible. That The Bible gives a clear, trustworthy message that we can know God and know how we need to respond to God. And when we think about the Bible, we can trust it because it wasn't just the work of human minds like ours. God carefully guided the writers to record exactly what he wanted. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 20 through 21 tell us this about the Bible. Peter said, 
Above all, you know this, no prophecy of Scripture comes from the prophet's own interpretation because no prophecy ever came by the will of man. Instead, men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So Peter was saying, you need to understand that there is nothing written in the Bible that was the product of some clever, intelligent human being. It was the very work of God. Now, God used regular people like you or I. God worked in them. They were obedient. They were trusting in him. But he used them to write what he wanted. It wasn't their message. And he guided different ones to write. And then it was all put together into the perfect message that we've got. So that's why we can trust the Bible. If it was a human philosophy or ideology, yes, that would change with time. God's truth, because it is absolute truth, and it is his message, not ours, it will stand the test of time. But we have to be careful because if you approach the Bible, just like any other book, and you just want to get information out of it, to, to, to look at it intellectually, you're going to miss out on so much because that is not the deepest purpose of the Bible. Yes, the Bible gives us a lot of information, a lot to challenge the greatest intellects among us. But the purpose of the Bible is that its message is meant to lead to belief. And that's exactly what John told us. When John was finishing up writing his long first letter, we call it the Gospel of John, when he was finishing that up, he wrote why he put those words down the way he did. He said in John 20, 30 through 31, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples that are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So do you hear what he's saying? He's talking about a relationship. He says, I have written things for you, yes, to, to challenge you intellectually, to give you some information to get in your mind, to believe in, to understand. But the deeper purpose is a belief of relationship, a belief of faith. John wrote what he did so that we could read it and understand that there is a creator God that came as Jesus the Savior, that he died on the cross individually for us to change our lives, to give us forgiveness, to take God's punishment, to give us eternal life. All of that put together, it is meant to lead us to faith, to believing, to trusting in him and having that relationship. And see, that really is why we exist. If you go back to the very beginning of creation, God created mankind, not because he needed us for any reason. We don't complete God. But God wanted a relationship with us. And that's what John is saying about really the entire scripture message, the entire Bible message. It wasn't only John's, but the whole Bible message is meant to guide us to belief, to give us information, but the information should challenge and touch our heart and bring us to God. So when we say that, well, you know, what reason do I have to believe that God is real? We have the Bible, and it is God's Word. It's not just human philosophy, human ideas. It's meant to lead us to belief, but understand this too. It has stood the test of time. There is no error that has ever been proven in the entire Bible. And some of the greatest minds of the world have tried their best to disprove it, but they can't. And on top of that, the more research is, that's done in the ancient history in the Middle East, that's done in archaeology in the Middle East, the more the story of the Bible is supported and proven to be true. So with putting all of that together, that it's God's message and that is continuing to be proven to be true, nothing ever proven to be wrong, it's worth our trusting and taking that message and letting it guide us to belief. So when we think about the blindness, they are, that there is no excuse for not believing in God. The Bible is a great, great thing to, to remind us God is revealing himself. But not only that, there's the natural world around us. The natural world tells us there is a creator. And I like how Paul wrote that to the believers that were in the church in Rome. 
Paul wrote this in Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 20. He said, For God's wrath is revealed from heaven against all godlessness and unrighteousness of people who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth, since what, we can, what can be known about God is evident among them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, that is, his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen since the creation of the world, being understood through what he has made. As a result, people are without excuse. So here Paul saying the same thing Jesus said. Jesus said, the Jews have no excuse for not believing I'm the Messiah. They have no, no, no excuse. And Paul says the same thing about all humanity. He says, when we look at this world, this creation, you see God behind it, and it's just screaming there's a creator because there is design and beauty. And when you think about design and beauty, it cannot be by chance. I mean, just think about the complexity of our one human body. Just, and that's only one small piece of the entire creation. We have multiple systems that are at work in our, our one body that keep us alive. And if one little thing in either of those systems fails, we can die. Now multiply that by all of the other living creatures in all of creation, and then put that within all of the life cycles that are part of the natural world. There is just an amazing improbability, impossibility that it happened by chance. It cannot be. There has to be a designer that put it together. And that's what Paul says about creation. You cannot honestly look at creation and say, there's, there's no guiding power behind this. God has made it so that it cries out, there is a creator. And so when we think about that world that, that God has made our world to reflect his existence, he wants us to know. And that's the point, I guess, behind all of what we're talking about this morning. God wants us to know he exists. He reveals himself. He reaches out to every single person. And that's where I want us to go now as we, we look at how do we live out the message today? How do we apply it to our lives? Well, I think it's a matter of accountability, that God holds us accountable according to the extent of our knowledge. In other words, God says, I'm going to hold you responsible for how much I told you about me. And so that will go anywhere from just creation to being able to read the Bible on your own and have the whole message spelled out there. So really the better question to ask as we're thinking about this is, what will I do with the knowledge God has given me? What will you do with the knowledge that you have about who God is and what he's done for humanity? What are you going to do about that? Well, you know, the question's going to come up, well, you know, what about those people that are somewhere off in the jungles through the deep, dark rainforest, and they've never even had an opportunity to see any, any outside person, much less hear the story of Jesus? You know, what's God going to do about them, okay? Well, to me, I think the best way to, to deal with that is when, we're th when it's concerning these other people that we just have to trust in God to be a loving God and a just God that he loves all people and he wants everybody to be in a relationship with him and he is a just God that never does anything wrong and he's not going to misjudge anyone he knows our hearts better than we know our hearts so when it comes to a matter of the people that haven't heard I'm going to leave that one up to God and let God decide what needs to be done. But when it comes to what I know, what you know about God, you know, I've, I've been in church all of my life, so I've heard a lot and I've, I've gotten a lot that's come into me. You may too, or you may have only heard little bits and pieces. But understand this, that we have to be careful because you may have been misinformed. I may have been misinformed. Just because we hear something that's told convincingly from somebody else does not mean that it's the truth. My challenge to all of us is that I take what I know and I test what I believe about God against what the Bible says. Because again, we've got to go back to that. Our human ideas can be wrong. We will get things messed up sometimes, but the Bible never will. We won't understand it perfectly, 
but the basic messages are very clear, very easy to understand. And so when I think I know something about God, the best thing I can do is go to the Bible and test that belief against what the Bible truly teaches is right about God. But then think about this. You know, we've been talking about there really is no excuse for not believing in God at some level. So consider the truth that God wants you, every person, without exception, God wants you to have forgiveness and eternal life. Take a look with me at 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. This is a very powerful verse. The Lord does not delay His promise, as some understand delay, but is patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. I mean, that's God's desire. He doesn't force anybody. He will not make anyone believe in Him, trust in Him, follow Him. But He wants every single person without exception. Jesus died for every single person without exception. So if you have never started a relationship with Him, let me encourage you to start that relationship with Him right now. Ask Him to forgive you of your sin. Ask Him to come into your heart and to take control of your life. Those are very basic things to understand how much He loves you and what He's done for you, dying on the cross to take your punishment. But you've got to ask, and I encourage you to do that. To, to, and if you want to pray that prayer right now of asking God to forgive you, to take control of your life, to come into your heart and give you eternal life, if you mean it from your heart, He will absolutely do that right now. So I encourage you to do that if you never have before. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for today and for this chance to be able to be challenged with your truth. And I know it is your truth. It's the Bible, and we can trust it no matter what we might think or want. Your word in the Bible is always true. And so I ask that you help us to understand it and to take the things that we've heard today and apply them to our lives to do our best to live by them. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, th again, thank you so much for being with us. And if you would like to donate to our ministries, then uh, they, I've got that on our website uh, where you can give either through our local bank here in Thailand, Gasikorn Bank, or if you are in the United States or somewhere else and would like to send your your gift through the United States. We have a nonprofit organization set up by my home church, Southside Baptist Church, and that information is also on our website, or there is, it's on a, uh, an earlier post here on our Facebook. But thank you so much for being with us, and may God bless you and continue to challenge you with His truth.